Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Armchair Cricket podcast, a podcast focusing on test cricket by Armchair Critics of the Game. We are recording this episode on the final day of the fifth Ashes test match um uh, which England have won right now. Um so let me welcome my co-host Ajit so we can talk about this. Hi Ajit. Hi Giri. How are you doing? How's the arm feeling? Uh where you mean my finger? My arm middle finger? finger? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Sure. I remember the whole arm was in a cast. That's why I thought yeah, I asked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my middle finger is still immobile. It's safely secured inside a cast. Uh-huh. So I guess I can't use it at the moment. But I get it checked again next week. Uh, so they'll remove the cast and do another X-ray and then check if it has healed enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they'll put the cast back on, I think. But uh, other than that, not so bad. How are you? Yeah, going good. I mean, it has been a very um, restful sort of a weekend for me, and uh, first weekend in five weeks where I don't have a match. So, I'm savoring the time I have on a Sunday, uh, sitting at home, mm-hmm. following cricket, and doing other things. You know, chores. So did stuff. you manage? Uh, did you manage to catch uh, the fourth day's play or the final uh, day's play as uh, it turned out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was able to keep up with it more or less the whole day. Uh, mm-hmm. I was able to either follow it on uh, guerrilla cricket. Mm-hmm. or i was uh, looking at some uh, uh, some of it on tv yeah it was a good day's play let me put it like this it was a very exciting day's play if you are a test match enthusiast so maybe we can dive right into it so yeah mm-hmm. it was a very interesting test match right overall if you look at it australia had come into test match with a chance of winning the ashes series outright it's they have not won an ashes series in england in 18 years so this time they retained the ashes on the uh, power that they had actually already won it in australia Yeah. but they did not win the ashes series outright again in england so the series finished to to all right so mm. um the first innings 294 was a bit of a uh, from england at least it was a bit of a downer because the way they started you would expect from 170 for three maybe they'll go to 400 and sort of make it very difficult for australia so they just made 294 but you know uh, there was a 5 4 for mitch marsh the returning mitch marsh he was sort of i think if you remember uh, before the start of the fourth uh, test he was let go from the squad and i think that was sort of a you know reverse psychology used by justin langer there where in order to motivate mm. him he was let go from the squad and told he needs to do more mm. it was sort of a u turn that he was brought back into the squad in the fifth uh, test and told he can emulate ben stokes mm. well he did at least the bowling part he took a 5 for it was his mm. first ever 5 for in the international cricket so well done him yeah. so international test cricket for sure so but what transpired next was more the more interesting part so australia also subsided to 225 here there was the usual suspect Steven Smith but outside of that there were really not um, any other big contributions except for Labushain who made 48 i think Labushain is also one of the finds for australia as far as the series is concerned right for me at least we can discuss this a bit later so mm. archer took a 6 for again so with another 6 for he's again confirmed of course how good he is at the top level and then this meant that you uh, know surprisingly gotten a lead the mm. england team would be themselves surprised that they had a lead at the end of uh, mm. the first mm. set of uh, innings Hmm. after which i think they batted very sensibly so uh, yeah. here delhi gets a lot of credit and uh, so did ben stokes who built the innings with him the second innings more or less and everybody who came after him had a chance to hit out so yeah. josh butler sort of went into a bit of a one day mode made 47 but outside of that there was not a lot to write and nathan hmm. line took a 4 4 in the third innings and then march took two and siddle and cummins took two as well so mm. this meant you know this morning the first fourth day morning when uh, england were dismissed uh, i don't know if you saw that uh, did you follow the beginning of the day's play very early i caught up with uh, uh, the australian batting when I, when they came out to bat in the second innings but not ah. before that i didn't see the ta- tail being wiped out well i mean there was at least one nice thing to see stuart broad seemed to have a little bit overcome his fear finally of short pitch bowling or maybe it was all expected he hooked uh, commenced for two sixes in a in a one over wow okay so that was nice to see but after that i probably you can give us a nice uh, recollection of what you saw chasing 399 uh, what happened to australia <laughs> what happened to australia let me ask uh, let me rephrase the question what has become of david warner aha uh-huh. i mean w- w- what is happening out there 
because Stuart Broad dismissed him for the seventh time in this uh, test series in all the five matches that David Warner have play, has played. He's been dismissed, dismissed seven times. Can you imagine that? I mean, uh, he has, as they call it, you know, he's, uh, he's his bunny, basically. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. And David Warner, uh, he was trying to be positive over that. I saw he tried to, you know, uh, there were some grimaces when he missed a few balls outside the off stump, you know, just leaving the bat. Mm. Uh, and he also hit a uh, well-timed uh, cover drive. Uh, and then I thought the David Warner of the old was coming back. You know, he looked a bit more confident and suddenly, yeah, uh, he went out. I mean, he he got, uh, he was uh, caught in the slips. Uh, and I think, I believe in the second or the third slip by Rory Burns. It was a good mm-hmm. catch, good sharp catch. Again, off yeah. the bowling of uh, Stuart Broad. Mm-hmm. Uh, but Stuart Broad, I think he had the better uh, of, I mean, I think he bowled really well against those two openers, Marcus Harris as well as David Warner. I especially watched the dismissal of Marcus Harris, and that basically set the tone for the Australian batting that was to follow. Mm-hmm. Uh, Stuart Broad bowled uh, a lovely in-swinger into the left-hander, so that would be an out-swinger. Right. Right. The ball just uh, moved into the bat, uh, onto his pads, and uh, Marcus Harris confidently you know, flicked it towards mid-wicket boundary for a four. It was well-timed. Mm-hmm. And people were lauding him, you know, it was a very good shot, well played and all that. And the very next ball, it was almost on the same line and also the, almost the same length. But it was just, I would say, on the fourth stump. The ball, right. you know, it seemed to come in towards the bat, uh, towards his pads. But then it just left the outside edge, you know, it, it went and hit the off stump, which mm-hmm. went cartwheeling. So it was a fantastic right. sight to see. Uh, and Stuart Broad, who was wicketless in the first innings, uh, in the end, I believe he picked up four wickets. Um, I think Australia had a very difficult task. You know, they had, they had a target of 399 to chase down. I think it was also the last test match. So, and the bowlers were out there. The fielders were out there for a long time. England made sure that Australia st- Australian fielders were out in the field for a long time. Uh, the batting had to click. It didn't. Even Steve Smith fell cheaply, you know, uh, right. by his own uh, high standards. He went out for 23 runs. Uh, and... There was some uh, stand between Mitchell Marsh and Matthew Wade, mm-hmm. and also a little bit between uh, Wade and uh, Payne. But apart from that, there was nothing else. Only Matthew Wade stood out. He made a brilliant century. He finally got out for 117 runs. But he was the only you know, batsman who played well and who played the long innings. He looked very positive. Mm-hmm. At the same time, he was also very uh, choosy in his uh, stroke play. Uh, in the end, Australia were dismissed for 263 runs, uh, well short of the target, 399. Mm-hmm, uh, Stuart mm-hmm. Broad picked up four wickets, and so did uh, Jack Leach, right? So right. the ball was spinning towards the end, and even Joe Root managed to pick up a couple of wickets. Yeah, in the end, I think England deserved to win this match. But I, I have to ask you this question, going back to the first morning of the day's play, mm-hmm. the toss. Mm-hmm. You know, the toss was won by Australia, and Australia you know, elected to field first. Do you think that was a good decision? Because Oval traditionally has uh, been a good batting pitch initially and the fourth innings was always going to be difficult here. So what do you think about that? In hindsight, it was definitely a mistake. But also at that point in time, Justin Langer himself was surprised at the decision taken by Tim Payne, right? So mm. maybe he was riding on the wave of uh, joy or confidence mm. that his bowlers had provided him from the victory in the fourth test. Right. Mm, mm, so mm. he decided to insert England in. Apparently, before going for the toss, the discussion mm. between him and Langer was that he would win the toss and elect to bat. <laughs> and surprisingly, he won the toss and elect to bowl. This is how we do it at club level, where your captain is suddenly switched the decision last minute <laughs> based on something he saw or something he observed. But at the yeah. highest level, that's a bit of a surprise. And, mm. you know, there is a saying in Australian cricket. I think Ian Chappell once said it on TV or something. So uh, when you win the toss, nine times out of ten, you bat first. The tenth time, you think a lot and you still bat first. That's a saying mm. in Australian cricket, mm, right? Mm, so mm. they know that if you ride out the first hour, maybe even uh, the first session out, right? Mm. Then the game is yours to play with. And it's a good pitch to bat on. So that was a real surprise. But mm. then, look, 294 is not a very bad total. I mean, it could have gone all wrong. They could have gone to 400. But then mm. I think Australia also let themselves down a bit in the Fee. first innings. So yeah. this, again, is totally due to the mastery of Broad and Archer. So Archer took 22 wickets in just, uh, you know, Four tests, mm. right? Mm. So that's a very good start for Archer himself. But the main cr- credit I would like to give is Stuart Broad. I mean, in the absence of mm. James Anderson, he's really yeah. stood up and shown he can be the next leader of the attack. If and when right. James Anderson uh, calls time on his career, mm. right? This guy can really lead the attack. He's clearly shown yeah. that, yeah. right? Yeah. That's one thing. The other thing, Archer has come through beautifully. 
So Archer has actually delivered on his promise. He's taken two six fours in the series. So that's nicely done. And of course, look, Smith had to fail at some point in time, right? He wouldn't continue to always be successful. So mm. he failed. He chose the fourth innings of the uh, this test to yeah. fail. And mm. of course, Matty Wade, uh, Matthew Wade, he, he's done well. He's scored 200s here, but not a lot in between. So something to also look up, right? 399 yeah. was going to be very tough. So uh, let's say the back of this test was broken in that partnership between uh, Stokes and Denley. So yeah. a lot of credit for that specific partnership for me. I would say. Mm-hmm. Delhi was, you know, he he looked not really comfortable. I think mm-hmm. on Guerrilla Cricket, they mentioned it was 94 for three rather than 94. Right? <laughs> so there yeah, were three yeah. chances. Yeah. Uh, so uh, in this case, he was also once very lucky that there was a clear dismissal of the bowling of Seidel, I think, if I'm not wrong, which was not reviewed at all. I and it was, was all three Marsh, right? Yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Marsh, yeah. was it? Well, maybe yeah, it was Marsh. Yeah. So, it was one of those, right? So when you look at that, so he had a share of luck. But then he's an opener, so he needs his luck. We know that. Yeah, right? obviously, yeah. But Tim oh, Payne, so. you know, Tim uh-huh. Payne, yeah, Tim Payne had a horrible uh, DRS uh, review again this match. I think he he got a couple of them wrong. Well, he didn't choose to review a couple of decisions. One of them was, I think, Denley's, and mm-hmm. David uh, Denley went on to make uh, 90, 94. Yeah. Okay, and then he caught a few blows. Did you see? <laughs> he got hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He got yeah. it uh, in the place where they say the sun doesn't shine. So, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was down and uh, I think he was batting out with uh, Joe Root. Ah. And Joe, Joe Root was having a laugh. Okay. Uh, it was unbelievable. It was, uh, I think everybody that... wanted to go near him. But at the same time, they wanted to stay away. Yeah. It's yeah. always like that. I mean, when, you, when somebody you know or when you're playing and you see somebody get hit, you'll always laugh. It happened to me in the last game. So yeah. one of my colleagues uh, in the club uh, game got hit flush. I think <laughs> I think you may be referring to the other polar opposite or to where the sun doesn't shine. I think uh, you got it wrong, but never you mind. We'll, we'll talk about it offline, I'm sure. So he got hit in the knackers. He got hit in the dick. As I think uh, in, at some point in time, uh, this is something Ben Stokes said in an interview or something. <laughs> really? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. He got hit right Good in the Good choice dick. of words. But yeah. Okay. So he did get hit in the box, unfortunately, and. Yeah, it, it's always funny when it happens to somebody else. But if you have ever gotten hit there, man, it can be very painful, like terribly painful. If I'm not wrong, I think he also got hit at the same place when he was fielding. Oh. Really, I think this was probably his second time. Man, that, that's that's terrible. I mean, I remember the jokes being made that he, luckily his daughter was born one day before. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. So yeah. That's, very, that's very unfortunate to hear that he got hit there even while fielding. Oh, yeah. Unlucky. And just spare a thought for him, you know, I think he... he he, he was supposed to bat at number four, like mm-hmm. he did when uh, Jason Roy was opening for England. Right. And he made the ultimate of sacrifice of, you know, coming out to bat uh, or open the innings for them in the last two matches. And he did reasonably well, reasonably well. And I think because of him, England managed to, I mean, like you said, I think that crucial partnership between him and uh, Stokes basically sealed the match for them. So it was, he had a very important role in this uh, test match. So well done to uh, Joe Denley. Look, I mean, I I think I disagree with you there. So, he mm-hmm. was actually more of an opener than uh, Jason Roy, if anything. This yeah. guy has actually spent the first half of his career, uh, first class career, as an opener or batting at three. And then, mm-hmm. then he moved down the order for his county team. So, I would say he was more suited to open. And finally, in the fourth and the fifth test, the England uh, management saw fit to play him at the top. And he's done good. He scored a mm-hmm. 50 and a near 100. So, well mm-hmm. done him. And what worked is, again, in the third innings, the openers got off to a 50. That was the only yeah. 50 partnership in the entire England summer, right? Mm-hmm. You know, out of six tests. So that's also mm-hmm. crazy, I would say. But then they got there. And then also one of the main differences, this was not exploited by England simply because of that guy, Stephen Smith, right? Mm-hmm. Australian opening pairs completely failed. All the opening partnerships that had, in the 10 opening partnerships that yeah. would be possible, there was 10 out of 10 failures for Australia. <laughs> Right, <laughs> but with this guy coming in at three or four, they never actually felt the brunt of it. But otherwise, it was terrible. I mean, yeah. also if you look at some of the other stats, we'll not go into it too much here. But the average of the top six outside of Steven Smith for Australia was under 20. They somehow carried through the series by drawing it simply because of that one guy. Otherwise, it was terrible. It was very very bad. So here, I think uh, the. Mm. Good work done by the England bowlers was not actually visible because, again, because of that guy. Otherwise, there was even a chance England may have edged a test or two. They may have even taken the series is what I'm saying. So, all mm-hmm. kudos to Stephen Smith. I mean, I'm sure he was the man of the series. So, really, he's Bradman X form and he's head and shoulders above every other test batsman out there. I think I mentioned mm-hmm. this offline. Nakul Pandey, uh, who has also done guest episodes with us, may have at some point in time mentioned 
that uh, this was while the fourth test was in progress and i think steven smith made a 200 so he needs to actually score 22 ducks in a row to get to the average of kohli who's nice. probably undisputedly the second best test batsman out there right? Right, right right can you imagine that's how far ahead steven smith is of the next best right. batsman so in your uh, f1 parlance what you always say hmm. man on the pole has actually uh, lapped the man in the second position literally mm-hmm. that's yeah. almost unheard of right yeah i mean it's also good return to form for him you know after that absence uh, mm-hmm. following that uh, right. uh, cape town episode uh, i think and the other thing is marnus labushain i think he's also a good find i think you touched upon it very briefly uh, mm-hmm. while you were uh, summarizing uh, this match right. i think he came in as uh, coincidentally as a concussion substitute for steve smith and then he has played 50, i think he has made 50 plus scores uh, about four or five times since he came on right um but if you compare uh, steve smith's performance against england supposed to be best batsman right mm-hmm. joe root i think joe root had a very middling uh, ashes this time round i think he i remember seeing a graphic which said he had an average of something like 32 or something in this mm-hmm. uh, five test series right um so i think he probably needs to yeah spend a bit more time out in the crease he had a 15 in this match in the first innings i agree but uh, i think he needs to be a bit more consistent for his team especially the top order to uh, make a difference if the mm. openers keep failing right uh, but, but coming back to the openers do you think these two are now settled rody burns and jordan lee for me they are settled going into the new zealand tour at least so mm. given how old denley is i mean nothing against him but he's 33 change so if you want to invest in the future mm. uh, maybe he's he's your option for the next 2 years if he really does the job well but otherwise if i were england electoral team i would say he should be on notice series by series but it's in his hands yeah. as long as he performs every series he holds the role down right yeah. for example yeah. chris rogers came in for australia very late in the career and he was still able to do the job for about 18 months right mm-hmm. so that way he is the man in the job for me so the moment mm-hmm. they promoted him to open he showed that he has the metal to stick it out right mm-hmm. at the end of the day there are there is no such thing as beautiful runs or ugly runs right it's yeah. runs that yeah. count yeah. yeah. he was able to do that in yeah. two tests so yeah. for me the england opening partnership is settled mm. right they have done a good job and joe root should ideally come back at 3 but i mean this is still an ongoing discussion right whether joe root should bat at 4 for me he's good enough to bat at 3 uh, and mm. what they have done in this test sort of suits the england batting mm. order mm. forward right mm. also ben fox should he come in it's a it's a really long discussion but yeah. they have a bit of time i think i counted somewhere it was about 65 days or 66 days left mm. until the next test that starts in new zealand so they go on a tour yeah. of new zealand uh, down under so yeah that's the next series for them for me the opening partnership maybe when the top 4 or 5 is sealed there yeah. comes the question of whether uh, both butler and bestow belong and whether folks comes into the squad so this is a long term discussion for me right what about the future yeah. of folks and these are all the questions we need to answer mm-hmm. okay. but uh, i heard a remark from uh, shane wan during the commentary in this match mm. what he said was uh, bearsto needs to give up his gloves and butler needs to uh, become the uh, you know designated wicket keeper in this team and bearsto needs to uh, move up the order maybe number 4 or number 5 maybe even number 5 right um in that case butler can come out and play a role like you know maybe adam gilchrist because he is suited to uh, play such a role i think he has the game mm-hmm. to take or to counter attack when there is a collapse top order collapse so he can do that so uh, i i don't know if, if bearsto wants to keep and england team play him as a keeper only because he wants to maybe they should think about it and if ben fox like you said comes in comes back in I mean I don't know if they have place for three keepers in this side this it's an amazing uh, problem to have for them um I'm talking about keepers team pain I think is also on a series by series uh, you know notice right he's also 34 right 34 35 the question I have is is he going to be the captain of the Australian cricket team until the uh, end of this world test championship that's a good point so for me look you you gain a lot of prestige and you gain a lot of uh, let's say kudos from the australian cricketing public the moment you bring ashes home mm. so he's the first captain to bring ashes home since i think mark taylor or steven war somebody right 18 mm. years ago mm. mm. so that gives him a fresh lease of life and in australian cricket we have clearly seen there are people like uh, hasi who's performed until he was 36 change mm. there was rogers himself chris rogers mm. who went on until he was 36 37 right so and even hayden i think played on until 36 absolutely so, yeah so mm. there is still a precedence okay him being a keeper it takes a higher toll on his body for sure mm. right mm. 
Hmm. But I think he can go on another two years. He is definitely the skipper in the upcoming, uh, let's say, summer season of Australia. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Given how he performs, I yeah. would say he might actually retain the skipper uh, position until end of the World Test Championships. This is one more season from that, right? Hmm. Hmm. So until 2021, uh, let's say summer. So it's highly likely he might actually retain the position of skipper. So. Barring a really bad couple of series or him, he himself actually struggling. He didn't do much of note in the series, 150, right? But then maybe he mm. has to improve on his DRS uh, reviewing and other things. Mm. But, you know, he's able to do, he's able to actually, there is a lot of chirping. There's a lot of yeah. chirping going on by the Australians, but nothing nasty. Yeah. yeah. Right? So he's sort of bringing that old, um, let's say, culture of Australia of talking, but still staying within the line, so to say. So that's probably Tim Payne's influence, I would say. But hmm. he has this positive influence and maybe they want to take it forward. Yeah. Well, I yeah. mean, there are always people who say Payne is just keeping it until Smith comes. Smith is eligible for captaincy in, uh, from next April, April 2020 onwards, I think. Hmm. Hmm. So they just say he's the guy keeping the seat warm. But in any case, he's, you know, if you remember uh, the sledge by Rishabh Pant. Yeah, babysitting. Temporary man. skipper or uh, whatever, right? <laughs> I think yeah. it doesn't hold water anymore. The moment you've captained in an entire Ashes series, you are... Position as a skipper of an uh, Australian team is sealed. And if you went back home with the urn, you've mm. done something that's not done in nearly two decades. So your, let's say, future is sort of settled as a skipper. Yeah. That's my way of thinking. I think there was a remark by Harsha Bogle during uh, India-Australia series uh, ah. earlier this year. Right. Uh, Tim Payne did not do well batting-wise, and although he's a good keeper. And I think he uh-huh. posed a question maybe to Shane Vaughan, if I'm not wrong, or Ricky Ponting. I don't remember who the other guy was. Uh, so he said, uh, will Tim Payne be part of this test team because you know he's not batting so well and then the retort from the the other commentator was no no he's out there as a wicket keeper not as a batsman so he will always keep his place in the team because he's a proper keeper so he, he might as well continue playing until the end of this world test championship Pro, uh, definitely as a keeper uh, although they also have matthew wade who is also batting not so bad at the moment um, but just just want to you know uh, throw some light on the World Test Championship table at the moment at the end of this Ashes. Just to read uh-huh. out how many points each team has. Go for uh, it. Just just to give a, a brief insight into how this works. So each team plays uh, six Test match series, with uh, each series being uh, given a full 120 points, which will be you know distributed amongst the two teams which play in that uh, series based on how many wins or draws there are. Uh, at the moment, uh, the top of the table uh, is held by uh, the Indian Test cricket team with 120 points uh, by virtue of their victory in West Indies, against West Indies, of course. And then uh, the second and third positions are held by New Zealand and Sri Lanka with respectively 60 points each. And then come Australia and England uh, with 56 points each because they also drew this Ashes series to all, although Australia get to keep the Ashes because they want it uh, back home. Uh, and all the other teams, West Indies, South Africa, Bangladesh and Pakistan have yet to open their account. So this is where it stands right now amongst the nine test playing countries. So uh, the way it works, the calculation is every series, every test match series, uh, like I said, is uh, 120 points. If they play a two match series, then uh, the points are distributed. Uh, if it's a win or if it's a tie or a draw, as 60, 30, and 20, respectively. If it's a three-match uh-huh. series, then it's 40, 20, and 13 for a win, tie, or a draw. If it's a four-match series, then it will be 30, 15, and 10. And then if it's a five-match series, like the recently concluded Ashes, it's mm-hmm. going to be 24, 12, and 8, which is why you see Australia and England having 56 points, as against New Zealand and uh, Sri Lanka on 60, and India on 120 points. So it's a very interesting format. So uh, if you count the total number of points that are to be had, so you have 120 points played across six series. So you can get a maximum of 720 points. So yeah, so it's it's very interesting. Uh, we'll keep following this because uh, with every series, we'll this points tally will get refreshed. Uh, and at the end, I think the top two teams will play the final at Lords. Uh, in 2021, yeah. summer right. of 2021. So very interesting. I really like this uh, test championship idea. Yeah, look forward to that. But apart from that, anything else you want to highlight here? I mean, I remember somebody funnily saying in one of the other cricketing podcasts we listened to. So they were saying um, 
when uh, england are competing with bangladesh or new zealand for a semi final spot in the world test championship uh, these points will come very handy it's very important that they win so i mm. i just sort of reco- recollected that this was in the lead up to the last test right mm. Mm. so england have done that but yeah. for me one of the other real conundrums that australia faces the opening uh, partnership conundrum right yeah so going with warner or marcus harris also got four tests and he has really not done much either mm. right and then they had already had another opener who also did not do much so they are sort of in a limbo what which way do they go really hmm. right hmm. so you had marcus harris you had usman khwaja who got injured and maybe you know usman khwaja he comes back into the equation shortly as well so for them do they actually uh, let go of warner he's been given five full tests now and we know his record in england is not very strong but even by his standards he had just 150 plus score Hmm. Marcus Harris did not even have that but Marcus Harris was the incumbent right hmm. going into the ashes so hmm. it's sort of a tough choice what are your thoughts on this well uh, uh i am a believer that david warner should be given a longer run i don't think they should drop him because he i firmly believe and this is my you know prejudiced opinion he is the uh, sevag of australian cricket test test cricket team okay so sevag also had a very bad run i think in the towards middle of his career indian uh, cricket career uh, and he was when he was playing as an opener he you know he got caught behind he had those early dismissals but then he came back he always came back and he always made such telling contributions at the top of the order just remember that uh, chase uh, in chennai you remember that uh, against england i believe uh, wasn't that in chennai 2000 2008 was it i do i do yeah yes. so david warner is capable of such performances and he for an opener he has an average of 45 plus and that's a very good average right i mean openers always fall early that's a very tough job to be an opener of a test cricket team so so he should be given a long run he should be given another series before they think about what to do with him he's just i think uh, they, i saw this uh, analysis done by uh, probably nasir huzair i don't remember who did it mm-hmm. they compared how he played against stuart broad uh, when australia came out to bat every single time i think the last three instances that he batted the first instance he took an off stump guard so he basically covered uh, his stumps the second instance he took a middle and off guard and in today's instance he took a leg and middle guard a middle and leg right? right so the question is he doesn't know or he is not able to find out where his off stump is so he's always playing out at those deliveries which are angling in but he's still well outside off stump so he's getting out you know while trying to leave the ball uh the ball just you know kissing the face of the bat that there was one such dismissal in the last test match as well so it's probably just short on confidence maybe something like kl rahul is going through right now for uh, indian cricket team so he may need a rest but there is no uh, test series coming up or a no test match coming up in the near future so he needs a few months i think few weeks off and that will do him a world of good maybe go back to uh, playing the limited uh, overs format make some runs there and then come back with a bit more confidence but he should be given a longer run i think he should be given a longer run about marcus harris i'm not too sure um he looks uh, you know uh, similar to a david warner mold but i'm not sure he's still a young guy maybe they need to stick with him there was a, i remember there was also another opener i can't remember what his name was uh, i think bankrof yeah he he sat out right he had a couple of uh, the test matches at the uh, beginning of the ashes and then he didn't do so well the backup opener himself is not doing so well uh, so it's indeed a problem but they need to stick with devon warner they need that experience i was actually expecting that he would go all guns blazing today at least you know show some positive intent and uh, come back trumps over uh, broad and uh, archer but it was not to be anyway um, yeah they need to stick with him and uh, khwaja i don't know uh, i don't know if he has to open the uh, innings for australia he still I think he should still play at number 3 for me. Khwaja when right. he comes back, yeah. Well, Labushkagni has done enough to sort of make the position mm. in the top 6 zone, you know. Yeah. It might mean if Khwaja comes in and if they want to have Khwaja there, maybe Khwaja might be at 3. Yeah. And then, you know, Labushkagni goes to 5. I don't think they'll do much with Smith. Smith is at 4. Yeah. He'll stay there. Yeah. Wade may miss out then or you know, they may play both wade and uh, khwaja but then i would say khwaja is also sort of dropped out of favor right so mm. maybe it will be wade versus khwaja when he comes back mm. which marsh has done enough i would say he took a five for this test he didn't do much with the bat he had a chance but mm. uh, australia is desperately looking for an all rounder who can do the job of let's say ben stokes right mm-hmm. so mm. ben stokes is quite 
extraordinary for sure but <laughs> they are they are looking for somebody who can do the role of a ben stokes right mm. so in this case we'll have to see if he can do the role there mm. so uh, it's going to be interesting going forward but as far as england are concerned the rest of their lineup is also settled mm. only you know there were some questions that needed answering and i would say the last test has proven the way forward for them but australia will need a bit more introspection their bowling attack is wonderful so i would mm. say the way the bowling attack bowled and the way they were handled both were mm. exceptional so cummins and uh, hazelwood uh, would be starting most games and sidel would be there or star would come back depending on you know the type of pitch and what sort of a role that is required and lion is being lion he was good even today or even yesterday he was really good so yeah. uh, that attack is sort of sorting itself out and pain slots in as a keeper then you need to pick a top 6 there so mm. it's going to be an interesting upcoming uh, series as far as australia is concerned when they go home i think they they host uh, pakistan if i'm not wrong so that's going to be a good series because pakistan mm. also will come with a fast uh, and a good bowling lineup because i don't know if you saw this uh, mohammad hasnain has been uh, Asked to, come, to back come back to yeah. in the first class uh, I did read trophy. This, yeah. Yeah. Right? His uh, NOC has been withdrawn from CPL. It's, it's sort of a bit of a knee-jerk one thing. If he was mm-hmm. ever issued one, why they issued it is a question. But maybe it's the change in management. Right? Is the K, K, what is it? Kaitai Azam, right? Kaitai Azam trophy. Yeah. Kaitai Azam, yeah. He's, and Wahab Riyaz has taken an indefinite break from uh, red ball cricket, I read. Yeah. So he wants to focus on white ball cricket. Maybe he's also okay. in the twilight of his career. So he's 34 he plus. That yeah. seems reasonable. Right. Yeah. Amir has retired so who do they have I mean we'll we'll talk about this in maybe another episode about Pakistan but uh, because you mentioned Hasnain I'm I'm a fan of you know tear away fast bowlers so of I course. really like to see that guy play in uh, Pakistani whites right I mean I hope you know he is given enough time to mature because hmm. not every 19 year old can be you know an hmm. akram and why I'm saying that is there Shahin Shah Afridi already who's playing hmm. so there shahin shah afridi there would be hasnain there would be hasan ali who would be back and probably somebody like fahim ashraf uh, they would look at somebody like that who would be mm. forming the rest of the attack so it's mm. a, indeed it's a detailed discussion that can happen again in a different uh, episode yeah now uh, if you were to quickly go forward i think uh, the t20 between india and south africa was rained out in dharamshala i think you had some thoughts about it giri about the scheduling of this match at dharamshala what was that again <laughs> well i had i have thought about everything uh, i have an opinion uh-huh. about everything and one of uh, in this case it's just that you know a t20 series being play being played in the middle of a monsoon season where it happens to rain i guess uh, in uh, in the northern part of the country towards the end of the summer so which is september right so uh, maybe they should have thought about uh, the weather conditions before actually you know uh, planning a match there having said that mm-hmm. the next two matches will be played at mohali Uh, yeah and uh, bangalore uh, right bangalore right. Yeah. yeah bangalore of course yes yeah. so and i don't like that you know playing a t20 match in bangalore i have talked about this earlier i don't like that <laughs> it's not it's a bowling bowler graveyard no no yes yes i hate that <laughs> well rcb is the home team and we know how well rcb no yeah plays. of course yeah yeah right yeah. now but i mean going back to what you said you know they say there is a saying about opinions do you know what it's it's not a politically correct one so to say but no, i know opinions are like dash dash everybody has yeah. one exactly you need you, you need to have that so it's it's not a bad it's not a bad thing right so going forward there is also the t20 tri series going on between bangladesh afghanistan and uh, zimbabwe so mm. there have been some very interesting matches going on there so considering that it's played in bangladesh and you know can be also a rain threat here and there and going on so in the first game of the series uh, bangladesh beat zimbabwe there was this zimbabwe team that was hobbled together at the last minute with the board being uh, welcomed back in and they came to play under larchan the rajput the coach they are sort of performing well you see them fielding well so bangladesh made 148 for 7 they chased down ba- zimbabwe 144 for 5 this was purely thanks to one player afif of afif hossein so this is the player who made a 50 out of just 26 balls and sort of really stole the match from under Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe had reduced Bangladesh to 60 for 6 in the chase. Mm. So there was very high likelihood that Zimbabwe would win but against mounting run rate he had just Mosaddegh Hossein for company who played a very mature and a calm innings and they took the game. So it was a bit of a disappointment as far as Zimbabwe was concerned but in the second game um, Afghanistan who are now, now the masters of the T20 it looks like they are on a 12 match unbeaten streak since the beginning of 2018 I saw. so they beat uh, zimbabwe comfortably again they overpowered zimbabwe so to say because they batted first and made 
197 for five with a lot of good contributions. They now have a new opener, Rahmanullah Gurbaz, who's also the keeper of the squad. He's very much in the mold of uh, Mohammad Shahzad. I dare say, at least in the shorter forms, this guy can be the replacement of Shahzad. Does yes. he look like him? Uh, no. He's no, a much okay. more uh, international cricketer size. So uh, okay, okay. Leaner. Not okay. a club cricketer size. Okay. And he hits out. He hits exactly the way Shahzad does. And he also sort of can flip between the two ways Shahzad can be. We, can, we see that because he made 43 of 24 in his debut inning. Right? Okay. And then the rest of the middle order contributed and... Uh, Najibullah Sadran made 69 and uh, Mohammad Nabi made 38 out of just 18. So the war, old war horse is coming really good. Nabi who retired from test recently, right? Yeah, the last two so Okay. He did that and uh, yeah. they beat uh, Zimbabwe because Zimbabwe also fought. They came to 169 for seven, but that was not going to be enough. They knew the chase was not going to be completed. So they did their bit, uh, their bit there. Mm. So uh, what happened that is not normal, at least as far as this chase is concerned, or the setting of the target was concerned, was... There were seven sixes hit in seven balls. Nabi hit four and Zadran hit three. Mm-hmm. In seven consecutive balls, seven sixes were hit and uh, sort of a flagging Afghan inning suddenly got a boost of 42 runs in just seven wow. balls. This is in- incredible. Yeah. And uh, that was nice to see. If you are uh, watching this uh, match live, I happened to be catching it live and it was crazy. They just went berserk. Right? Mm. So in the last match of the match that happened today, Afghanistan beat Bangladesh. So Afghanistan continued to have their stranglehold over Bangladesh in this tour. They beat them in the test earlier comfortably. So now, you know, they seem to show that they have this complete mastery over the conditions as well as the home team. So that's great to see. So again, batting first, they were in a bit of trouble. They were 3 for 19 and 4 for 40 in a T20. But then from there, uh, Asghar Afghan stood up this time. He made 40 and Mohammad Nabi made 84, again, out of just 54 balls, and they took them to 164 for six. It was sort of a middling sort of a target. It was not a very great target, but their openers uh, did really well, the opening bowlers, especially Mujibur Rahman, who took three wickets for 12 in his first spell. And that went, you know, Bangladesh were going to be struggling. So they were three for 31 and four for 32 later. From there, they couldn't recover, and they were only able to come to 113 and all out in the last over. So in spite of a 44 from Mahmoudullah, they couldn't do much. So again, the spinners... Did really well with, of course, Rashid Khan taking uh, two wickets and Gulbadi Naib taking two wickets. Farid Ahmed, left arm fast bowler from Afghan, took the last two wickets. So, all in all, this is going to be, you know, it looks like Afghanistan will be sort of sealing their position for the final. But uh, it's going to be one of Bangladesh or uh, Zimbabwe. Both have a chance here. So, let's see how it goes. But I would back Bangladesh to make the final. So, if you were to quickly look at some of the other news from outside of the cricketing field, Pollard has been named as the T20 and the ODI captain. So, first of all, he was not even in the ODI team. He couldn't make mm-hmm. the ODI team at the World Cup. But he's been brought back into the ODI team. And maybe based on the bad performance of West Indies in the World Cup, I think mm-hmm. older. So, he's been relieved of captaincy of the ODI team and the T20 mm-hmm. team. And Brathwaite was the captain of the T20 team. They have been yeah. taken out and Pollard has been named as a skipper. What are your thoughts on this, Kiri? So, they basically rolled out the red carpet to uh-huh. welcome their old hero, right? Right. So he's been playing franchise cricket all over the world. So he finally gets his spot now. I think we we had him in our uh, team prediction for the World Cup, the 50-over mm-hmm. World Cup earlier this year. And it was a su- surprise to us or a shock to us that he wasn't included, even though he was fit. I am pretty sure West Indies will do well. I'm not sure about its captaincy, but I think the wealth of experience he brings from playing a shorter format of a game all, game all around the world, I think uh, he will do well. And uh, yeah, with the T T twenty, uh, with the T twenty World Cup coming, uh, we're coming up next year. I think uh, this will stand them in good stead. Indeed, I I think it's a good move overall. I mean, it looked like they were also looking at the fact that he wanted to do it. It was not like it was going to be thrust upon him like it was on Holder. He was keen to do it. That's a good thing to see, right? Uh, let's see. I mean, we wish Pollard all the best. So yeah, yeah. going forward, I think he's able to bring some glory back to the. Limited over teams. Uh, we know Holder is doing all right, barring a small blip in the series against India. I think Holder is doing all right in the long for longer format. Let's hope Pollard is able to do that in the shorter format, right? So there was also this um, T20 tri series going on between Netherlands, Ireland, and uh, Scotland uh, to make up for the postponed Euro T20 Slam. Mm. So in the first match of this series was also rained out in Malahide in Ireland. So this was between Netherlands and Ireland. It could not go through. Yeah. So. One person I would like to bring uh, to notice is a young opener who's representing Netherlands for the first time, at least he's in the squad. His name is Vikram Jit Singh. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I got a chance to watch this guy. He's a left-hand opener. He's 16 years old. Really? Okay. Man, he's a real talent. I got to see him live in one of the top class matches here in the Netherlands. Okay. He's just 16. He, he looks well built for a 16 year old lad. Uh, he's, I'm sure, eating all the cheese and milk from the Netherlands. But uh, <laughs> he's also a medium fast bowler who can take the bowling first change. Right? Oh, okay. So he's very exciting. And he batted very composed. And I'm hoping he's able to bring uh, big things for ne- Netherlands cricket in the upcoming years. Right? He could be the next uh, Rant End or Scott or somebody. So I'm okay. really. A hard hitting batsman or uh, is he. Uh, no, no. He's a proper batsman. The, what I saw of him, he batted 10 plus overs up to 15th over. I think he batted and he looked very comfortable leaving the ball and, you know, playing the waiting game against the fast bowlers and taking the game to the spinners. He had both the components that I saw. That's and nice. when I saw him bowl, he has the, he can take uh, the, let's say the first change bowling. So he has a lot to offer and he's only 16 change. So I'm really, really looking forward to this guy. And how next he time, does. tell me where he plays. I'll come and watch. I'll try, I'll try to keep yeah. it. It'll have to be probably the next season, but we'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. All right, so we saw the news that Strauss and Boycott have been uh, awarded the knighthood. Uh, mm-hmm. Theresa May, in her, uh, let's say, so to say, the resignation letter almost, has nominated mm-hmm. these two people as the knighthood uh, nominees. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Strauss, I think we saw it coming, right, for all his work, yeah. And yeah. both with the England cricket on and off the field, as well as his charity mm-hmm. concern. Yeah, he's raised a charity in the name of wife who died mm-hmm. recently. He sort of fits into the role, and it was sort of coming for him, I'm sure, right? Mm-hmm. What about Boycott? Well, in my opinion, uh, just like boycotts, you know, I think he should have been knighted much before Alistair Cook. So the the one of the best opening batsmen that England cricket team had, he should have been knighted even before Alistair Cook. But it's good to see that he gets uh, this knighthood finally. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to stay steer clear of the controversy that he was once involved in. So I'm not going uh, to talk about it. I will leave that to you. But I'm a fan of boycott, so I, I think it's very good to see that uh, we're going to see that Sir, you know, alongside his name, Sir Jeffrey Boycott. It's going to sound good. For Indeed. Your Indeed. I mean, he deserves it on his cricketing achievements, no doubt. And also, he is one of the people who believes he, he needed to have it already 25, 30 years ago. But there was this unfortunate <laughs> domestic violence incident uh, in France. And also, he's not exactly an establishment man. He's sort of irreverence to the establishment, you know. Yeah. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. somebody in his position could have been a former MCC head. All of these things could have happened. All the establishment roles he could have taken up, right? Yeah, he's a straight I talker, right? I mean, he's a straight talker. He, you know, yeah, calls yeah. a spade a spade. But if you look at yeah. Strauss, they are two contrasting personalities. And Strauss oh, no. is Strauss the gentleman. Is, Strauss yeah. is also a very straight talker, apparently. No, but he knows how to, uh, you know, uh, how to shape his sentences, how to use a certain word in a certain way without, yeah. you know, Ah, insulting yeah. somebody directly i mean i was listening to this podcast the spin podcast and in that david gower was a guest and he said something very funny he said england uh, establishment is just correcting a small you know error uh, mm-hmm. typo because in his passport probably it was always sir jeffrey boycott so he's probably <laughs> given his name as sir jeffrey his first name oh, how apt how apt so they're just correcting a small you know error in uh, lithography or you know just the way yeah. they put things on paper so yeah. anyway apart from the jokes look his his contribution to cricket cannot be denied. And given that he retired as the top scoring batsman, test batsman, I think he deserves it. And uh, congrats to both uh, Strauss and uh, Boycott for their knighthoods. Well deserved. Right? So the last thing I would like to say in this other uh, news section is that uh, All India Radio have teamed up with BCCI and have secured a two-year contract to broadcast all Indian international and domestic matches, both men and women's, right over radio. And this will also be available on YouTube, I heard. So this is fantastic, fantastic news for the likes of me who likes to, who love to follow cricket uh, by listening to it, live cricket, especially at least the longer formats. So it'll be fantastic, right? So I hope this is not a one-time thing and this thing continues because if you've seen the popularity of something like Test Match Special or Guerrilla Cricket who are able to give a ball-by-ball commentary of cricket. And therefore, it should be more uh, younger generations in India and abroad should also take it up. So it's a very good thing to have, I would say. Yeah, but so, I hope the commentary is not subdued. I hope it's lighthearted and, you know, humorous. No, no, they keep it very lighthearted. I, I had a chance to listen to this commentary for the India West Indies series. Hmm. It was available on the Prasar Bharati channel on YouTube. So it okay. was fantastic. So it was it was relevant enough, but not very, uh, very straight and very, you know, very serious. It, it was lighthearted. It was good. Hmm. Okay, nice. All right. Going on, uh, let's move on to the trivia section now. So the trivia question from the previous episode was, 
what is the best bowling analysis by a pakistan bowler in tests so it was sort of uh, in keeping with the topic we discussed about abdul qader's passing so our uh, keen listener yogesh has written to us with the right answer as usual but also he's provided some interesting trivia this is always a feature with yogesh smith he always gives us some trivia so what he says is he was really unlucky he could have uh, emulated laker and taking 10 wickets uh, in the innings so this was 9 for four in lahore and it was against england so in this case tosif ahmed took the other wicket so tosif ahmed the other spinner took david capel who is the fast bowler who bats in the tail and it was very unlucky that kadir only had 9 wickets right and there were seven lbws apparently in the 13 wickets that kadir took in his uh, test there were uh, seven lbws so it was very interesting that not a lot was spoken but in 1987 england team touring i would really be surprised because that was a tour where there was a lot of bad blood between a certain uh, mike gatting the captain of england and uh, shakur rana the empire so uh, never you mind so this is a topic for another day but all mm. in all it was still abdul qadir so the trivia question for this week is when was the last ashes series drawn so when was the last drawn ashes series today we are discussing that there was a two all draw between england and australia so when was the last drawn ashes series and how many series so far have been drawn so there are two components to this question so we wish uh, all our listeners a good luck with this question and you can write into us either via social media at armcheck fit pod or uh, via the facebook page or you could write in as a comment on any of the apps that you use for example or you could write to us at armchair.gmail.com you could also share your thoughts about how you think our podcast is going or you could talk about this with your cricketing friends so it will do us uh, you know some uh, good because if you discuss this with your friends we get more listenership and we get more ideas on how to do the podcast we are always looking forward to that there is quite a lot of cricket coming up there is the south african tour of india that has begun and there is this ongoing tri series bunch of tri series and lot of other cricket also to look forward to so i hope you do stay tuned in having said all that it's a good bye from me and it's a good bye from him bye bye you're listening to the armchair cricket podcast